responsibility for care and uh, uh, for you and care in those difficult moments of life, but also concern for the condition uh, of your life and your soul and your walk with the Lord and that kind of thing. So Pastor Joel, you'll see, is bearing a, a lot of that area. Uh, and so I'm not going to comment on any of these, but just kind of read down through them. Uh, hospital visits, that's largely Pastor Joel. First aid, and by that I kind of mean like... Uh, that, that little counseling that we do to help get you, if you need long-term help, we'll probably refer you out, but help you get stabilized and, and, and stuff. That's Pastor Joel. Uh, connections, helping you get connected to the body, to a ministry, to a to a small group. That's Pastor Joel. Uh, and then getting a, an additional community, and, and which is going to be the hub of our care for one another, but it's also the hub for our evangelistic effort. That's Pastor Joel. He has oversight over those things. Uh, on my side, uh, how I play out the shepherd role is largely prayer. Uh, it doesn't mean that Pastor Joel doesn't pray, okay? Uh, but but one of the things that I believe God's called me to do is have a, a, a fairly organized, robust prayer life. And so I, I will show you that I care largely by getting prayer requests from you and then praying for you throughout the week and stuff like that. The other way that uh, I work in this area, the shepherd role, is by uh, developing systems to help us grow in our discipleship and also help make sure we don't fall through the crack, uh, the cracks. And so that that's kind of plays into my personality. Under the next slide, the teaching role, you notice that we've decided that that's largely preaching. That's how we fill that role, and we're splitting that roughly 50-50. On the next slide, the, the, the leader role, guys, you need to know, Pastor Joel has, has a bent towards and gifts in problem solving. So we're going to leverage that uh, in tackling a lot of administrative stuff. That's where he's going to really be there. Uh, God has wired me more on the, the one of the ones that strategizing side of things. And so, again, we're trying to leverage that, lean heavily into that. And so my role is more in the areas of vision and strategic direction, uh, heavily involved in leader care, helping the people who lead our individual ministry teams uh, be able to function well and make sure those teams are well aligned and well resourced and those kinds of things. Uh, and then, um, just like I said, ministry oversight. And so hopefully these three quick slides just help you see how w what we're really trying to do is lay uh, a lean into our individual gifts, strengths, and passions for the benefit of the church. And so the percentage is different. But we each fill all three of those roles. Now, in the coming, coming weeks, we'll give you a little bit more uh, opportunity to see what, you know, what do we do during the week? Uh, how does this play out in real practical terms? All right? Hope that helps. Joel? Nope. Start with Jim. <laughs> all right. So now, Joel, or, uh, Andy took care of the main thing. Joel's going to take care of the end part. I'm going to fill a little bit in the middle here. Mine's going to be announcements here for you here this morning. Uh, for those who have in the reports due, those are due today. So, um, Gail will be hounding you shortly. If you don't have, don't get those reports, hand it to her. So please do that. Revive, 
is having a Super Bowl party on February 2nd at 6 o'clock here at the church. Um, again, it's at 6 o'clock here at the church. Families and small groups are invited uh, to attend. Please bring a dish to pass. And then also for Revive, we have Bethany Blizzard on February 7th and 8th. And there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, which is... Does everybody know where the bulletin board is? Across from the mailboxes. One person knows where the bulletin board is. <laughs> so it's across from the mailboxes. So go see your mailbox, turn around, and that's where the bulletin board is. And that's where the sign-up sheet is for that. And deacons, we're going to finally have our meeting this week at Tuesday at 6.30 here at the church. Um, and announced last week that Blanche Carlson is turning 90 years old today. And they're having a birthday party for her at the Heritage uh, in Greenhurst from 2 to 4 today. Uh, so there's information in your bulletins for the complete details. And again, uh, the family has invited the PBC out for her birthday party today from 2 to 4 over there to uh, at the, the village. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Greenhurst. So. Uh, if anyone has any questions of where that's at, come see me. Uh, it's right at the bottom of my hill. I slide down the hill. It's right at the bottom. <laughs> Annual Soup and Sunday is coming up fast. Uh, please see your bulletin for details. And also there's a sign-up sheet in the back of the auditorium for Soup and Sunday. Uh, also, don't forget, there's a post-bridal shower for Mary on February 8th. Full details in the bulletin. And again, the sign-up sheet is in the back of the auditorium. And then trustees. There will be a quick meeting following the service in the back of the auditorium. Uh, a few things to go over here this morning. So if you have just a few minutes after the morning message, uh, meet in the back of the auditorium for a quick trustee meeting. So with that, before the praise team jumps together here, uh, let's just open in a word of prayer here this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for today. Thank you for the people that came out to... Uh, visit with us here this morning, Lord, and just thank you for the family here we have at PBC all together, Lord. Thank you again for the pastors here that have come to lead us, and uh, again, Lord, just, we want to continue to pray for those churches that don't have pastors. We all know too well about that situation, Lord. So, again, thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, please stand with us. Uh, today we're going to be singing about how much we depend on Jesus for everything. I don't know about you, um, unfortunately sometimes I can tend to forget that. Um, I just want to remind us all and sing about uh, how we depend on Jesus for absolutely everything.
imagine trying to move a hospital? One of the missionaries that we've supported in the church for at least 20 years now is Memorial Christian Hospital. Jason, you got that slide there? Memorial Christian Hospital. We, we've been supporting them for a long, long time. And uh, one of the things there in Bangladesh where this hospital is that we, we've had a huge part in to make happen to our tithes and offerings. Uh, they outgrew that hospital years ago uh, and have been praying and working uh, toward the day when they could have a new hospital. That day has come. In the picture behind me there, you can see the old hospital is those dilapidated buildings around the outside, and the new hospital is that brick structure in the middle. And uh, so we're, this morning, I, I'm bringing this to your attention because they have an urgent prayer request. They're moving. They, they've been moving this week and this coming week, and they have going to try to finish the move into the new building uh, by the end of January. So let me just read to you a little bit uh, from, from one of our, our doctors there. Um, he says, January 24th is quickly approaching. Uh, it's gone now, but he says, it's the day we see our first outpatients in the new Memorial Christian Hospital. Everyone is busy. There are people everywhere packing, unpacking, cleaning, organizing, taking things apart, putting them back together, polishing and generally taking care of thousands of details that need to be completed in the next few days. At the same time, our hospital ministry, although slow, does not stop. We continue to take care of emergencies, perform surgeries, take care of new patients, deliver babies, and do the inevitable C-section. So if you can imagine moving a hospital and staying open at the same time. Uh, and one of the other things, um, that just because of how God's worked it out, they don't have a hospital administrator at this time. And on top of that, their field team leader for ABWE uh, is off the field with leukemia, um, or battling leukemia. So this is just a huge, huge undertaking. Uh, they've already moved, Jason, can you bring up the next slide? They've already moved a few departments, laundry. And yeah, they do it uh, by hand. Now on the next slide, you can see they've got uh, that all set up. They've moved the lab already. So you can see some of that there. Uh, as the guys are take, literally have to take apart every piece move it to the new place, hope that when they get it put back together that all the parts are there and that the equipment still works uh, because most of the equipment they have is donated. On this slide there, I bring this to your attention, um, Samaritan's Purse, some of you had some connections with that, Samaritan's Purse was able to find for them a very gently used x-ray machine, get it there, and so praise God they, they finally have a, a good x-ray machine. Uh, you can imagine a surgery department without that. Um, and so they've got that all set up. Uh, so just amazing stuff there. Uh, now it says here, uh, continue on, as soon as the outpatient services are moved, we'll begin on uh, inpatient and surgery. By the end of January, we'll have moved the entire hospital and be fully functional in the new facility. It's hard to imagine, after so many years of prayer, planning, more prayer, and construction, we will soon be using our facility as an answer to years of prayer. And we're excited to see if God will use it for his glory and his kingdom. Please continue to pray for And here we go, guys. I'm going to bring up the list of prayer requests. Uh, pray uh, that the myriad of the details and finish the work will be completed. For wisdom and prioritizing the dozens of jobs that need to be done. And that we will safely shift all of our supplies, equipment, furniture, etc. Pray that we can continue to safely care for our patients amidst all the upheaval and turmoil. Pray that despite the immense pressure on everyone, we'll stay unified as a staff and communicating with each other and working together in love as an example to those around us. And pray, lastly, that despite our busyness, we will never forget why God has us here in the first place to make disciples of all people. Amen. And so uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to just pause. So I'm going to give us about 30 seconds individually, silently, where you're at. You can pray. It's okay to pray with your eyes open if you don't have these memorized behind me, uh, these prayer requests or whatever. But just uh, would you take a few minutes, pray for these missionary brothers and sisters that we've been supporting in the move, and then I'll leave us together in prayer. All right? Let's pray. Thank you that we as a little church in western New York 
have had a small role in building a hospital on the other side of the world. God, that is so good of you to allow us to do that. We're so thankful. And uh, Lord, I pray for our brothers and sisters there who are working on this move and, and for their unbelievably strategic ministry that they have there and for the many, many people that they've shown Christian love to and for the many people who come to know Jesus Christ through that hospital. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to help them grant every one of the prayer requests that we have just prayed for today. And Lord, I pray also that in your great grace and kindness, you would answer the prayer or give them everything that they, we haven't even thought to pray for. But give them everything they need, Lord. We pray you'll foster them in your work. And Lord, we pray that you'll be honored and glorified in the way that we use the offerings that we're taking up at this time. We pray in Jesus' name. grade if you are here you can head on out the back anybody kindergarten through second grade they have something prepared especially for you good morning it's good to be with you again this morning you know you can open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3 uh, if you have your Bibles or maybe an app on your phone, however you have the scriptures, you can turn to Philippians chapter 3. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation. Uh, maybe you have. I remember when I was in college and Carrie and I had just started dating, uh, we didn't, we had a, we, we, went, we went to school together in Iowa and then she was from Iowa. I lived in Ohio at the time. And so when, uh, when school would let out for the semester breaks, you know, I would go back to Ohio and she would live in Iowa. And so we would communicate however we could. Generally a lot, she would send emails to me and she would send me these, these love letters uh, through email. I don't remember, she did, she sent me, she sent me love letters. Uh, or either that or she was chastising me for something I had said previously, which was probably true too. Uh, I don't think we ever sent anything through the regular mail, did we? She doesn't remember. Obviously, I left a, left a mark there. Uh, <laughs> so she would send me these letters. And Carrie, if you've had the chance to talk to her yet, she's very conversive. Like she, she likes to communicate. 
And, and so she would write these emails to me, and they would be very long, not necessarily a lot of formatting, just paragraph after paragraph of all these different things she wanted me to know. So I would read it, and I would respond back, and I'm not as communicative as she is, and so I might get three or four lines sent back to her. Uh, but I would get these letters, if you've ever gotten letters like that, and how would you read them? So like when I would read it, would you, would you do this? You know, you would read like the first section of it, and then you would say, uh, that's good, I'll, I'll let it rest, and I'll come back in a week, and I'll keep reading. You know, and then you'd come back in a week, and you'd read the next little bit. And then you'd say, okay, I'll, I'll, that's good, I'll, I'll come back. And then you'd come back the next week, and now what, what was she talking about the last time I read this? Well, no, you wouldn't do that, or I didn't do that. You would read the whole thing all the way through so that you would catch the flow of the letter and what it was that she was trying to communicate uh, as you would read it. Now, I start by saying that, remember, as we're going through the book of Philippians, that's how it's intended to be read, right? One of the... Uh, challenges that we face when we meet like this and when we're going through a book of the Bible. You know, we get together and we talk about chapter one and then we break and we go home and life happens for a week and then we come back and, and we talk about the next little bit and sometimes we can forget uh, the flow of the letter and what it was Paul was trying to communicate. And so as we get started, I want to hit the reset button just a little bit and rewind back to the beginning of Philippians and remind us what the flow is here. What is it that Paul is talking about? Because again, he wrote this to be read at one time. One, one giant thought as he's writing here. So remember in chapter 1 of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, Paul talked about that the gospel is everything. Everything that we encounter, the circumstances in our life, the people that we interact with that sometimes do and don't have our best intentions in mind, Paul said everything there is for the advancement of the gospel. It's to proclaim Christ, to see God glorified. Everything is geared towards that. And then he kept writing, and we looked at chapter 2, where he gives us some do's and some don'ts. Remember, we looked at that last week. You know, we talked about uh, to be unified, be considerate, be humble, don't seek the spotlight. He kind of said, okay, if the gospel is everything, and it's all for the advancement of the gospel, well, then let's transition. Here's how you live that out. And again, then keeping that one letter thought in mind, in chapter 3, what we're going to look at today, Paul talks about his journey through the gospel. You know, he, he kind of comes back and he says, okay, the gospel is everything, here's how you live it out. But let me tell you how I reached that conclusion, Paul says, when we're going through Philippians chapter 3. You'll remember a couple of weeks ago we looked at that diagram, the three circles, I have it on the slide there for you. And Paul is describing his journey around these three circles, uh, what is the gospel? And here's the big idea. The one thing Paul wants us to remember as he's communicating in chapter 3, the big idea is this, and this is where you can begin to take notes. We don't live in order to balance the scales. We don't live in order to balance the scales. And now, if you're looking at your outline, you can see we're going to keep your pens busy today. We've got a lot of things we're going to work on writing down together. And that word live, let me define what I mean there just a little bit. You could have put any other word in there. You know, we don't uh, work in order to balance the scales. We don't serve in order to balance the scales. Anything that we do, the acts that we do, the things that we say, we don't do them in order to balance the scales. That's the big idea I want us to capture this morning as we're going through Philippians chapter 3. And Paul divides chapter 3 into three different sections, if you will. We call, I call this, uh, this, this message together the gospel before, during, and after, three different sections. So the first thing is the gospel before. The gospel before. Let's start reading now in Philippians. Well, uh, read the first three verses. In addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs, watch out for the evil workers, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. The next thing you can write down is that Paul doesn't put any confidence in the flesh. Paul doesn't put any confidence in the flesh. Now let me let me define what he means here when we're talking about that word flesh. We're going to use that a few more times throughout our time together. And here's how you can define flesh in this circumstance. 
uh, values and activities of humanity unaided by the Holy Spirit. Values and activities of humanity unaided by the Holy Spirit. Here's what Paul is saying. He says, I don't put any confidence in the activities that I do. I don't put any confidence in the things that I say or the works that I'm able to do. Before Christ came to pay the penalty for my sin on the cross, man tried to become righteous before God through the law. Right? The law was a list of do's and don'ts, and here's, uh, here's everything that you can do uh, to try to become righteous on your own. But the law's purpose, the whole purpose of the law, was to show that nobody could become righteous on their own. It simply wasn't possible. We read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, uh, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written, Everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. What this verse is telling us is all it took was one tiny mistake. One tiny thing that you didn't get right in your life to be cursed under the law. And so Paul starts off in chapter 3 by saying, I didn't put any confidence in my ability to follow the law. So he doesn't put any confidence in that. But if he did, here's the next thing you can write down. But if he did put confidence in the flesh, he had more to count on than anyone. If he did put confidence in the flesh, he had more to count on than anyone. Remember, we're talking about the gospel before here, so let's keep reading now. Verse 4. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, Paul says, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. We're going to start making a list here of all the reasons Paul has To be confident, we're saying everything that I have reason to be confident in, if you think you're confident, if you think you're a good person, if you think you are checking all the boxes, Paul says, I have more, I would be at the front of the line, and he starts listing them. So the first thing you can write down, uh, I called it family. Family, here's what he says, the beginning of verse 5, he was circumcised the eighth day. What that means is, is that Paul grew up in a home where he had parents that followed the law. He didn't have any any say in the matter, any choice if he was circumcised on the eighth day. So he had parents that followed the law. It might be like if I was giving my story or my testimony and I said I was privileged to grow up in a godly home with godly parents that took me to church. That doesn't save me. But in essence, that's what Paul is saying here. He had family. The second thing you can write down uh, is he had a pedigree. Pedigree. Here's what I mean by that. Keep reading in verse 5. Of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. That is, he had a history. He came from the right place. And he was just associated with the right people so that if he was earning his righteousness through the law, he came from the right place. It would be like if uh, you, you remember the Hatfields and McCoys and their feud. And if, if one of them went into a job interview and they said, how do you get along with your coworkers? Are you good at forgiving people? And he said, well, I'm a Hatfield. Uh, just the association by saying I'm a Hatfield would, might carry with it the idea that he's not really good at forgiving. He likes to carry grudges. So flip that around. Paul is saying, I came from the right group of people. So he says, I have the right pedigree. The third thing that he says is he has knowledge. He has knowledge. Verse, the end of verse 5, regarding the law, he was a Pharisee. The Pharisees knew everything there was to know about the law. And he says, if you want somebody that has a lot of head knowledge, that can answer all your questions, that knows all the right things there is to know, Paul said, I'm your guy. Uh, Greg Frank, I don't think is here this morning. He uh, is working out the camp. They have a retreat there, about 140 people uh, is my understanding, so that's great. Uh, praise the Lord, they're able to come and to use the camp. Greg, I don't know if you knew this, before uh, he came to camp, he worked in an onion plant, an onion, uh, I don't even know what it's called, an onion farm uh, out in Washington State. And Greg and his dad, Wally, can tell you everything you've ever wanted to know about an onion. Things I didn't even know were facts. You know, I'd be in the kitchen, and I'd have an onion out, and suddenly Greg or Wally would come up, and they'd start telling me what kind of onion this is and how many rings it should have and how you can tell a good onion from a bad onion and who's going to buy this onion and who's not going to buy this onion and how many pounds of onion they're shipping. And he just will go on and on. Greg, can, Greg will eat the onion, but nothing else, just eat it like an apple. 
And I'm just like, man, I'm just trying to put some of this on my sandwich. You know, just stop. <laughs> you don't have time about onions. So if you have any questions about onions ever, you go talk to Greg, and you talk to Wally. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, hey, you want somebody that knows about the law? Right? Then he can have confidence in their knowledge that they know all the things. Paul says, I was a Pharisee. The fourth thing that he writes down here, or that Paul says, is he had activities. He had activities. This is the beginning now of verse 6. Regarding zeal, persecuting the church. Regarding zeal, persecuting the church. Another way to say zeal is great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause. And Paul says, you want somebody that's passionate, that always shows up, that's always serving, that's excited about it. You don't, get any, uh, you don't have any more zeal than I do, Paul says. I persecuted the church. That's as far as you can take it. And the last thing you can write down is reputation. Reputation, this is the end of verse 6. Regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. That is, Paul was a good person from human perspective. Nobody could point out anything that Paul had done wrong. He held the law as good as anyone, and he had it all. And if the law justified, if Paul could, do, could be declared righteous by the works that he did, Paul would be at the front of the line. That's what he's saying. He said, you think you have confidence in what you do? You think that you're a good person? Paul says, I'm a better person. Let me show you everything that I've done. And he lists these out. But Paul knows that this doesn't save him, but we see the world around us doing this. You remember back to those three circles, and we live in a world of brokenness, and people try to get out of that by doing different things, whether it's wealth or education. For Paul, it was religion. Paul tried to get out of his state of brokenness by the things that he did. But if we're honest with ourselves, we sometimes do the same thing. Sometimes we, we think that the things that we do the laws that we keep, the conversations that we have, the ministries that we serve in, the fact that we're here every time the church doors are open. And those are all good things. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But we do those things because we want God to be happy with us. We think we are somehow paying God back, that we are indeed living to balance the scales. Paul knew that the law couldn't save him, and the law doesn't save us, and we don't live to balance the scales. And so Paul transitions now to the second part, the gospel during. The gospel during. Paul came to realize that everything he did, this list of accomplishments that we just read in verses 5 and 6, all of that was worthless. It couldn't save him, and he was still cursed. We continue reading in Galatians chapter 3, Back where we were just a moment ago, Galatians 3, verses 11 through 13. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, because it is written, Cursed is everyone who is, hung, who is hung on a tree. So Paul acknowledged that fact. He knew that all the things he did, uh, we know that all the good things we do can't save us. And so Paul continues writing back in Philippians 3, verse 7. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ. Paul's gain turned into loss when compared to his gain. Paul's gain turned into loss when compared to his gain. Let me say that another way. In other words... Paul's accomplishments turned into garbage when compared to Jesus Christ. Paul's accomplishments, that list that he showed that would be uh, impressive by any measure, right? Like that, that list that we just looked at in verses 5 and 6, anybody would be proud of that. Like those are accomplishments. He had been doing something with his life from an earthly perspective. But when Paul compares that 
to the value of knowing Christ, he says that his accomplishments, that my translation uses the word dung, yours might say rubbish or trash or garbage, and he compares it three different times, just in those two verses, three different times. He says, I consider what I had. I thought it was valuable. Then I met Jesus Christ, and in the value of knowing him, over there doesn't matter anymore. Not only does it not matter, you might as well be garbage or trash. Paul's flesh couldn't save him, but knowing Jesus could. I want to illustrate this in a lighthearted way, if I can, in kind of a, a simple way. This idea of considering this valuable, but suddenly now it's trash. Let me illustrate this in a lighthearted way, if I can. Uh, I grew up in a pastor's home, and my dad, from time to time, when he would preach, he would bring one of us kids, me or one of my brothers, up on stage to illustrate something, and as they say, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Uh, so I have asked my youngest son, David. David, would you mind coming up and help me out? Okay, this is David right here. Come on up here. Okay, this is my youngest son, David. David, you are eight years old? Yes? Okay, good. Whew. Remember. Uh, David is uh, a blessing to our family. If you have not had the chance to talk to David yet, uh, David likes to converse. He is a talker. He, lo he would love to come have a conversation with you. And uh, Now, I didn't tell him, did I tell you what we were going to do here? I just said I was going to ask you some questions, right? And I said they're going to be easy questions. Okay, very good. You're doing great so far. So we didn't tell him what we were going to do. Let's hope this goes according to plan. All right. Uh, David, glad you are here. Uh, I'm glad that God put you into our family. And so just for you, I have a special gift just for you, for nobody else. All right? I have a little something here. There you go. Okay, I think I have the first slide there, uh, Jason, because I know you guys might not be able to see this. I have here, it's a special certificate, David. It says, for David Hart, and it's a scoop of ice cream. What's your favorite kind of ice cream? Cookies and cream. Cookies and cream. Hey, you can't go wrong. Anybody else, cookies and cream uh, people out there? A few? Okay, great. You can't go wrong with cookies and cream. Now, David, here's the special thing about this ice cream. This is only for you. You don't have to share this with Zachary. You don't have to share, don't get too excited about that. <laughs> you don't have to share this with Natalie. Uh, nobody else in this auditorium, uh, well, except maybe for your mother eventually, nobody else gets this ice cream. This is just for you. Would you like that? Okay, there you go. You can have that. How does, how does it feel to be the only person that has the ice cream? Good, good. All right, so it feels good. Uh, does that have value to you? Like, are you excited about that? You're not excited about that. Why not? It's just paper. Well, it's just paper. Okay. <laughs> well, what if we turn that into ice cream when we get home? Will you be excited about that? Okay, very good. That's it. You can have a seat. Good. Okay, actually, David, uh, one more thing. Come back. I forgot. Come back up here. Now, here's the thing. You just told me you were, that was valuable and you're excited about that, right? All right, so you can take that and sit down, or I have another certificate for you. Go ahead and switch to the next picture. Now, this is an ice cream sundae. Here, you take a look at that. We got chocolate pieces, marshmallows, uh, sprinkles, cherries, Oreos, all sorts of ice cream. Uh, now, you can, you can keep what you got because you said you were excited about that. Or you can crumple that up, throw it away. I will give you this, and we'll make one of these when we get home today. Where's the trash? Where's the, where's the trash? Okay. All right, go ahead, crumple it up, throw it away. You just throw it anywhere, that's fine. All right, there you go. You can have that. You can have a seat. Good job, David. That was good. All right. Hey, that, thank you, David. Appreciate that. I told you they'd be easy questions. I, I think I'm going to have to stop at the store on my way home now. Um, <laughs> Here's what, here's what I'm trying to illustrate. I said it in a lighthearted way, in a simple way. David had his one scoop of ice cream. He, he thought that was pretty good, right? He was excited about that. He had something that nobody else did. He had his one little scoop of ice cream, and he was good with that. He was content, and he was ready to go sit down until he saw this other thing. And that's the way Paul interacted when he met Christ. Paul thought what he had was good. It was gain, right? It was a list of accomplishments that anybody would be proud of, but suddenly when compared to the surpassing value that it says in Philippians of knowing Jesus Christ, 
Suddenly everything else was trash. It was garbage. That's what Paul's trying to say in Philippians chapter 3. Picking it back up in verse 9. Paul then tells us his gospel story. Verse 9, you can put, we're going to go back to the three circles on the screen. Here's what it says in verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Don't miss what Paul said there. Paul tried to get out of the brokenness cycle by trying religion. Paul was just trying to be a good person, but he said, that didn't declare me righteous before God. The righteousness that he had had to come from God because of his faith. Verse 10, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That is, Paul then continues to move around the circle to recover and pursue where he wants to know God. And that word know carries the idea that it's gained by experience, that God just doesn't leave us there at the gospel, uh, but we are pursued to follow after God to become more like him. And then in verse 11, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead, where we have the hope and the promise of one day being fully restored. So that was Paul from the gospel during. Finally, we get to the gospel after the gospel after. Because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, we are then propelled to keep moving forward. Because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, we are then propelled to keep moving forward. Let's continue reading in verse 12. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it, because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, and really the whole book, has been striving towards this point that Paul just said, in verse 12. Did you catch it? That God, does, God just doesn't leave us, that we are called then, if you're a Christ follower, to be more like him, to pursue after God through these things that Paul has been talking about. And why? Well, it's not because we're trying to balance the scales. It's not because we are somehow trying to get Jesus Christ to take hold of us, but it's the opposite. In verse 12, I make every effort to take hold of it, Paul says, because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. We don't do these things that Paul talks about for God to love us more. We don't do these things in order to try to balance the scales. We do them because God has taken a hold of us. We do them because of how Jesus Christ has come and has paid the penalty for our sin. Paul gives just a couple more encouraging thoughts. Verse 17, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. This is the second time Paul's given us an example. Chapter 2, he said, follow after Christ. He said, adopt the same attitude as Christ. Now Paul is saying, imitate me. If you aren't sure what to be doing, if you aren't sure how to be living for the Lord, Paul says, if you aren't sure how to know him more, imitate me. That's what Paul's saying. Do we live our lives in such a way that you could go up to someone who's new in the faith or maybe known Jesus for a while and say, if you aren't sure what to do, if you're not sure how to follow after Christ, imitate me. Well, that's, a, that's a sobering thought to think that we want to try to say that to somebody to tell them to do what I do. Being a parent has illustrated this or magnified it in my own mind even more, and if you have kids, you understand. Suddenly, your kids notice everything that you do, and they pick up on a lot of your habits. Some of them good, but most of them you wish they didn't notice. I don't consider myself an angry driver, okay? Now, <laughs> Carrie is the most gracious driver and patient driver you'd ever meet. Horns are reserved for the absolute emergencies, just, I mean, very rarely. 
You've heard the phrase, a happy horn is a honking horn. Now, I wouldn't say I fall down that far on the scale. I'm probably more somewhere in the middle. But if you pull out in front of me, I might honk the horn to let you know you shouldn't have done that. I'm, tr I'm trying not to do that too much. But one time in Louisville, I was driving with my kids. And, you know, you have to understand, I'm not even sure my kids knew that a car had a horn because most of the time they go with my wife and she just doesn't honk the horn. So we were driving and someone pulled out right in front of me and I, and I honked the horn and for, you know, a couple moments and <laughs> honked the horn and, and, I, and no sooner had I let go of the horn but one of my kids yelled from the back seat, that's the way to do it, Dad. <laughs> uh, you know, I was like, what, what, what uh, no, you know, now listen, don't, don't, don't imitate me in that, you know, don't, don't, I'm not saying dad, dad did that the right way, but how did you guys even know that was me honking, you know, and, uh, yeah, but man, boy, I was, don't, you don't, you don't have to do that just because daddy does. Paul is saying, imitate me. Paul says, I've learned that the flesh doesn't save you. I had more to brag on and I have more to put confidence in, Paul says, than anybody else. Paul says, even I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. Paul closes as he closes this chapter, and as we begin to close out of the book, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. So then, my dearly beloved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown. In this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. For the second time, Paul tells us that we're citizens of heaven. You remember he mentioned that earlier in the book. Why is that important? Paul's saying, remember, we are not permanent citizens of this earth. We are citizens of heaven. And if we're living with that in mind, all these things that we're talking about, because remember, this is one long letter from Paul. He didn't intend for us to divide this up into weeks, but it's one long letter. And he's saying, remember, the gospel is everything. Follow after Christ, follow after me, because we're citizens of heaven. And so the gospel is the only thing that matters. But don't forget, you can't save yourself. I think it's applicable that he's reminding them of that here. And he's reminding us that we are citizens of heaven. And we don't put confidence in the flesh. And how is that possible? How is that possible that we're citizens of heaven? He says it there in verse 20. We wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment, Pastor Andy's going to come and he's going to lead us to the communion table. And it's a time of remembrance and a time of thankfulness when we acknowledge, God, we can't repay you for what you've done for us. As hard as we might try, and Paul tried harder than anyone, we can't be justified through our works. It's only through our faith. And God made that possible by sending his son to pay the penalty for my sins. And it's because of that that then we serve God by what we do, not the other way around. And that brings us to the big idea concluded. We don't live in order to balance the scales. We live because the scales have been erased. We don't live in order to balance the scales. We live because the scales have been erased. And praise God that he provided a way to do that because we never could have done it on our own. Let's pray, and then we will celebrate together through the, our communion time. God, we are thankful for the reminders that Paul has been giving to us in this book of Philippians, that no matter how hard we try, we can't save ourselves. We can't find justification through the things that we do. But it is only because of Jesus Christ shed blood that he became cursed on the tree to take my place. In your name we pray. Amen.
It tells us that on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him, the teacher says, my time is near. I'm celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. And when evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and, and he blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In the course of that supper, Jesus took the common stuff that was part of that celebration, the Passover celebration, and some bread and, and some, some wine. But he filled it with brand new meaning. And he said, this bread, from now on when you eat this, I, I want this bread to be a reminder of my body, which is about to be broken for you. And they didn't completely understand that. But in a, in a few hours, they, they got that figured out as Jesus was crucified. And, and Jesus said, and from now on, when, you, when you're having this special time together and you drink from this cup, it's no longer about the Passover lamb that thing that happened way back in the time of, of Exodus, it's, it's now about me, the lamb, who died to take away your sin. And this is about my blood from now on when you drink it, remember that. And, and not only my blood, but the new covenant, the new arrangement that we're going to have together. So Jesus filled that with, with meaning for them, new meaning for them, and he left instructions for us to remember him and his sacrifice and the new covenant by eating these same things, a little bit of unleavened bread and some grape juice or some wine. And those instructions are found uh, that he passed on to, to Paul there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'd like to read just a, a touch of that as well. And Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this, or eat this, in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup and after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So let us let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. So this thing that we're about to do, this is a remembrance ceremony. And who can participate in it? Well, this, this is for followers of Jesus. And by that, I simply mean people who, who believe that Jesus did what he did, that he, he literally came and he lived that perfect life in our place and died in our place and came back to life to prove that he was God and bigger than death and all of that. It's for people who, aren't, who believe that and are trusting that, just like what Pastor Joel just said. We're not trusting in our ability to somehow get ourselves right with God. We're trusting what Jesus has already done, and we're believing that that's all that's needed. So this is, this is for followers of Jesus, people who believe, people who trust, the people who are trying to obey the teachings of Jesus in their practical, everyday life. But notice it's for people who've taken a moment to make sure that they are right with God and as much as possible right with other people. And so to help with that, we're just going to give just a, a short minute, uh, 30 seconds to a minute here for you just to stop and say, God, is there anything between me and you? I know Jesus died for all of it, but if there's something that is between us, I, I want to confess that and agree with you, Lord, that, yeah, that's wrong. And I believe that Jesus paid for that, too. So I'm going to give us just, again, uh, about a minute or so, just to silently right where we're at, have that conversation with the Lord, make sure we're right with God. And if need be, that, and, it's a, and you're able, if you need to get right with a person and you're able to do it, they're here nearby, take time to do that too, because we want to do 
this in a way that shows God, God that we honor and we want to sacrifice for him. Bob, let's do that. talk through real quickly what we're going to do or what we're about to give you an opportunity to take a tiny piece of bread and a little cup of juice and um, uh, deacons are going to come through and they're going to hand, hand out the bread and then just if you just stick that on, on your lap or something because just in a few seconds later the second group will come through and give you a cup uh, and so you'll have both of those please if you would just wait for my signal and, uh, and take a deacon group in
Let's pause and give thanks tonight. Father, God, it is such an amazing, amazing thing that you did on our behalf. We could never earn it, nor have we ever deserved it. So, Lord, I pray that we will be honored and worship as we just take a moment together and we eat and we drink and we celebrate and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take the bread. Drink the juice in memory of Jesus' death and in celebration of the new covenant. It's good to be reminded. Of it is our tradition. So if you'd like to 